We've been talking a little bit about the uh, a new long-term binding treaty on climate change. Can you tell us uh, why we're, there's so much talk about that right now and um, and when we might see something like that? Yeah. So the last time I was at a UN climate meeting was actually two years ago in Copenhagen and it was really important then that we came up with a climate treaty and we didn't come up with a climate treaty and so it's even more important now that we come up with a climate treaty because in the intervening years the only thing that's happened is that more greenhouse gases have accumulated in the atmosphere and that we've experienced more of the impacts of climate change. So we've seen all over the world these extreme weather events that are that are linked to climate change and uh, uh, this is the kind of thing that we know how to prevent. We know what's causing the problem. We have the technology to solve it. Getting t the world together to come up with a global solution in the form of a, of a global climate treaty is what we need to do in order to solve the problem. But why do we need a treaty? We need a treaty because without a treaty, it's impossible to be sure that countries will do what, they're, what they say they're going to do. And we need a deadline for that treaty because it's only when we have those deadlines that we see countries coming forward to the table with something new. We saw that in the run-up to Copenhagen. It was, a, it was a big deadline. And countries came forward and said, okay, we're going to solve this problem, we're going to do something. And, and we need that kind of deadline to happen again. And then we need to have some assurance this time that when that deadline comes, what we have is going to be in the form of something that's legally binding that isn't just a bunch of voluntary actions. So what kind of deadlines are we talking about and how are we going to get that assurance this time? So the smallest and poorest countries here, the Association for Small Island States and the Least Developed Countries, um, have said that they need a treaty now, in, in 2012 essentially, and and of course uh, that's true, we need a treaty now, in fact we needed a treaty yesterday and the year before. Um, there are other countries that have tr that have uh, much less, um, shall we say, uh, optimistic timeline. So the United States has said, oh I don't know that we need a treaty until after 2020, so nearly a decade from now, and we just can't afford to wait too long. There's too much at stake in, in terms of food security, in terms of water security, Security. We just can't afford to wait that long. What are some of the impacts that we would see if there's no legally binding treaty before 2020? Right now, even uh, if we if we keep emissions as they are, uh, there there would be enormous impacts, um, and th and that's why we need a treaty that would bring emissions down. And so so if we if we it, there's there's a range of potential outcomes, but I think it's worth talking about what we're experiencing today. So right now we have three quarters of the degree of warming. If we don't get a treaty that would limit us to below two degrees of warming, and just to give people some context, the difference between now and the last ice age is is only six degrees. So when we talk about each degree, it's a dramatic amount of warming. So right now we have three quarters of degrees of warming and what we're experiencing is these extreme heavy downpours happening. Um, it just happened a few days ago in Durban. People died uh, uh, as, these, as these conferences were opening in the United States, my home. We've seen cities like Nashville washed out, states like Vermont washed out. We have to rebuild everything. And this is what's happening with three quarters of a degree of warming. It only gets worse as, as, as the, the global average temperatures go up and so there's a really enormous uh, importance in bringing temperatures back down which means that we need to bring the greenhouse gas pollution back down which means we need a legally binding treaty. But this has been warming, we've been warming for over a hundred years now, why is the difference between two years and eight years so significant? Right now we are at a point in time where uh, what we do right now has a huge impact and that's because all of the scenarios that scientists have put together that show how you limit warming to below two degrees, all of those scenarios have global emissions coming down in the next few years. And so that means not just that you know emissions are going up like this and we don't just want them to go up a little bit less, we actually want them to start coming down. And that needs to happen in just a few years and that means a dramatic increase in the amount of clean energy and it means doing it really, really quickly so we don't lose this window of opportunity. We're really, really, I mean, despite the fact that we have the technology to solve this problem, despite the fact that we that the economics are really compelling of doing this, we are in danger of losing this window of opportunity of preventing ca catastrophic climate change. But aren't a lot of those actions happening already, even though we don't have a legally binding treaty that the U.S. has signed up to, for example? 
actions are happening. I'm not sure I would I would say a lot of actions are happening. Things are happening. Really, really inspiring things are happening in many, many countries. So I'm wearing this uh, lanyard that shows that Scotland has a 100% renewable energy target by 2020. Uh, the country of Denmark just said that they will increase their emissions reduction target to 40% below um, 1990 levels by 2020. And the work that's happening in some of the emerging economies is, is the most impressive. You have countries like the Philippines that have enormous energy efficient, I mean, um, renewable energy targets, um, Mexico, South Africa, Brazil, all of these countries are doing amazing work. And the country that people talk about the most, China, is actually has domestically legally binding targets that are very, very impressive. So yes, action is happening, but we just saw in the last few days a report come out from UNEP showing that it's not yet enough. And of course, the elephant in the room is the United States, where we don't really have the um, the confidence that emissions are going to come down in the United States. The United States does have a target that was put forward in Copenhagen, but, we, but we're not confident that, that the administration is taking this issue seriously enough yet. We've had sort of a, a, a mixed record, and so we're looking for assurances that they're serious about that target. And, but to be honest, what we need is a, is a, is a much more ambitious plan. If the U.S. is willing to negotiate a binding treaty by 2020, why aren't they willing to negotiate it by next year? Why wait eight years? It's, you know, it's, for them it's about that they feel like they've already negotiated something up to 2020 and so they want to negotiate what is that? the next thing. The, the Cancun agreements uh, follow, are, are through 2020 and so from their point of view we should start for the next time period. Um, and that would be fine if we had the luxury of time, but we simply don't because the impacts of climate change are, uh, are building and there's so much inertia in the system that they get significantly worse as you wait. Why are the Cancun agreements insufficient from between now and 2020? The Cancun agreements uh, are are significant. There there are a lot of um, targets that were put on the table, but but UNEP, the UN Agency for Environmental Protection, just put for, put out a report showing that even at, at the highest end of the targets that countries put forward, um, it, it's not sufficient for limiting warming below two degrees. The fundamental flaw in the system that we came up with in Cancun was that there's no way to revisit the targets countries have put forward. So imagine you're out to dinner with with some friends, you get the check, every Everybody, you know, puts down what they owe, and it doesn't add up to what the bill was. In this case, what's happening is countries are just saying, "Oh well, doesn't add up. Let's go." But you can't just, you know, eat and run. Uh, it's some we have to have some way of figuring out how we can put enough on the table so that we're 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 getting to where we need to be. So, what should we expect to see here over the next week? What's the process like before we can find out if there's going to be a treaty or not, or a mandate, I should say? So, um, on Monday, the ministers arrive, um, and a lot of the political decisions uh, will will start getting made once they arrive, um, and and a lot of the compromises will start to happen. And so, what we're looking for is progress in those high-level political discussions, so that we come out of here with clear timeline to getting to another climate treaty. Do you expect that'll happen? Uh, it is certainly our expectations that countries will do the responsible thing and make that happen, yeah. And are you talking to the countries behind the scenes as well? We are. Civil society is here. Um, we, we, are, we are talking to them on a regular basis and, and letting them know that, that, that the, the weight of the world is on their shoulders and that, that there, there are many, many voices outside of this uh, conference center who, who, who want them to know that, that they need action on climate change. Are there actions happening from people in various countries around the world as well? There are. I don't know what all of them are, but I know that there's a lot of stuff happening all around the world. Um, and uh, I know that in the case of the United States, you know, tens of thousands of people have signed petitions about this somewhat technical topic of wanting to make sure that, that the United States, uh, you know, acts responsibly here in Durban. And so that's inspiring to see. We also have a letter that came from 53 members of Congress um, pushing the administration to, to act responsibly here in Durban and come out with an outcome next week. Week. And is the Kyoto Protocol important in all this as well, or is that uh, a thing of the past at this point? Uh, it is important. We are definitely are in danger of losing the rules of the Kyoto Protocol, which is very important because it took 20 years to negotiate those rules, and we can't afford to start from scratch and start over because of the, the urgency of, of getting things done immediately. So your goal is to keep the Kyoto Protocol and negotiate a new treaty at the same time? That's right. And the new treaty should happen when? 
the position of, of civil society here is that the new treaty should should be we should start negotiating it right now, and we should be finished negotiating it by 2015. And would it take effect immediately then? Uh, it would take effect when uh, when countries ratify it. Of course, it could be provisionally in effect uh, before that. Great. We'll keep an eye out to see what happens. Thank you very much. Thanks so much.